Whoa. <laughs> it worked, but then it was like, ah, ah. <laughs> Sorry, that's my ringtone. All right, so guys, welcome to The WAN Show, the weekly show where we make asses of ourselves on a regular basis. We actually have some corrections from last week's show that I would like to get right out of the way here at the beginning. So number one correction is that um, <clears throat> if you fire a bullet straight up into the air, terminal velocity and wind resistance and all that stuff, it's not coming down at exactly the same speed that it was when it's going up. I and it's a, Yeah, well, I didn't. Okay. So I'm correcting myself, okay. if that's okay with you. So if it's fired straight up into the air, the odds of it actually killing someone are extremely low. However, what we were talking about was shooting down drones, in which case you wouldn't necessarily be firing up directly in the air. It still and has the same effect. Mythbusters busted the myth that firing straight up will cause it to come down at the same speed. But what they also found is that if you fire up at an angle, it, there is a very good chance that it would kill someone. Yeah. Because it maintains a lot of its forward momentum regardless of the whole falling speed and whatnot. It so might still be flipping and stuff. We were right. technically wrong but it's still dangerous if people shoot at drones. So that's number one. Another correction from last week is that HDMI 2.0 does have support for 8K. It's just the reason that we didn't give any cares about it is that it's at 30 frames per second or 24 or something like that. So it's and, like... Uh, weren't we also specifically talking about 1.4? Yes, we were specifically talking about 1.4 at that point in time. All right, also, we were a little bit simplistic about the whole uh, Walmart thing and sort of the supply chain and how much things cost. So there was an article here that was linked to me. It's on Google+. Plus. Linus, I'm a fan, but your extremely simplistic explanation of the cost of bringing in a product was unbelievably condescending and just plain wrong. So there you guys have it. You can check that out on Google+, Plus, where I said, good point, we'll discuss on the next show. But one of the objections that this particular viewer had was that 30 years ago, the average ratio of what the mean income of a worker at a company versus the CEO was, was about 30 to 1, whereas now it's about 270 to 1. And that is a completely separate issue, one that does need to be addressed at some point and that Linus Media Group definitely believes firmly in um, fighting because I actually don't get paid much more than anyone else who works here. So. <laughs> that 30 to 1 is not, 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 a, not a thing. I can strive for that 30 to 1. I will be, I will be pretty impressed with myself Although if I, I manage to pull that off. I think companies off. that have 30 to 1 are like giant national chains and stuff. Well, yes. Not four-person teams. Well, four-person teams could still... I could just, I could just take all of the money. Yes. I don't yes. even know if that would still equate. <laughs> <laughs> if I paid everyone minimum, minimum wage. wage and still took everything, I still don't think you'd make it. <laughs> And we'd, like, lose the house. Oh, all the stuff. sad face. All right. <laughs> so we have some great topics for you guys today. Number one is Haswell E-Specs have been allegedly leaked. Perhaps they're right. Perhaps they're not. We don't know. But there was an article posted that seems to have some either correct specs or what look like fairly realistic fake specs. Also, the smart bra could be a thing. Is it for women? Is it for gamers? We don't know. Also, our guest today is Anand from Anand Tech. So, the guy who got me into PCs. If you guys like built your first PC by watching our videos, then he's like the equivalent of that for me because reading his articles was what really got me passionate about computers and technology. So I'm extremely excited to have him joining us in about 25 minutes here. And then we've also got some other cool stuff before we fire up that intro. So we've got consumer hard drives versus enterprise hard drives in terms of reliability. There was a test done. Kind of. It's we'll talk about it later. Observations of an environment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a bunch of Xbox One trolls and a bunch of iPhone trolls. And this is getting hilarious but consistent. And I, I feel bad, but it's still really funny. So, so without further ado, let's get on with the show.
So guys, our number one sponsor of the show today is Hotspot Shield, the easy, quick to install VPN solution. And our second sponsor is Intel today. Buy a qualifying fourth generation Core i7 or Core i5 processor and get a free copy of Rome 2 Total War. This is for a limited time and unfortunately, sorry guys, um, only from select retailers. So that's in Canada and the US, but either way, make sure that you check that out. So without further ado, why don't we get into our first topic here? which is that Oculus has gotten a massive $75 million in additional funding to jumpstart the virtual reality business. So this was posted on the forum by Top War Gamer. The original article is from TheVerge.com. And how excited are you about this? Because you're the, probably the biggest Oculus fanboy in like... It's probably a hundred kilometers square from here, at least. Probably, actually. D did I tell you for, for, like, my family Christmas thing, I'm bringing my computer and Oculus home so everyone can try it? <laughs> did I tell you about that? No. We have people, like, coming in from Eastern Canada to visit us and all this kind of stuff. My mom was like, oh, we need an activity. I was like, we can all play Oculus Rift. <laughs> so she was down, so we're doing that. Wow, that Anyways, is awesome. Like, <laughs> that like... might extend that range that <laughs> you just came up with by a little bit. Family Christmas at the uh, <laughs> at, at Luke's family's <laughs> seriously, hundred percent. I'm stoked. There we go. All right. Uh, <laughs> so all, a lot of this money is going towards actually like producing, making, and getting ready to sell mass the production, units. like yeah. making it happen. I mean, the it, the, the development they already kind of spent they that money. They have them. Yeah. They kind of have them now, but that's they need way more of them. As everyone on Kickstarter ever discovered, there's a lot more to raising the funding to bring a product to market than just covering the cost of having it manufactured and then kind of going. Yeah, we're done. Yeah, so that's what a lot of the money's going to. And an interesting quote from one of the big investors who's now going to be on the board because he invested so much money, or not exact quote, but basically what he was saying was when he saw the developer kit, he wasn't 100% sold and he wasn't ready to invest, which I completely understand. Because when you have the developer kit, you can see all these pixels and you can actually like easily see the grid in between the and pixels. And you have one, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, 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 Wonderful, but you can still see the pixels, so it's still kind of a rough experience. And he said that once he saw the consumer version, which is a higher resolution, he was sold and he was ready to invest all that money. So that actually makes me super stoked because I haven't tried the high res version yet. Which, like, man, I'm stoked. Because that's one of the biggest things that I find holding it back. And for me personally, what I'm really excited for is the consumer version to be released, a whole bunch of people to buy it, and then people start building accessories for it. Like, uh, when we were testing the Omni, yeah. the gun that was there was not super great. I was so sad when I saw Jan's uh, Shark Tank appearance. I don't know if you guys watch Shark Tank, but uh, Jan, I can't remember his last name, but he's a super nice guy. He actually, if you search for Virtuix Omni on YouTube... Um, him walking us through a, like a tour of the product is one of the first hits. He's a great guy. He, he invented the Omni and, uh, he was on Shark Tank. I think his issue was he was asking for too much money for too small a share in the company because otherwise I think they wouldn't have been so harsh, but they basically just said, uh, I think the, the lady invest potential investor said something like if my husband brought this home, I'd divorce him or something like that. And I mean, I understand that from a mainstream perspective, but we need, we need guys like Jan and we need guys building accessories for this and turning it into more than just a thing you put at your, on your head and sit in your chair. We need things. In fact, Where'd, oh, where'd my stinky footboard go? We need things that uh -huh. enhance the way that you interact with your PC, whether it's the tongue controller that that Valve employee developed yep. or the buttocks controller or foot pedals, all these different ways that go beyond keyboard or mouse and beyond the controller. That debate of keyboard mouse versus controller might just be completely dead in another five years. And I'm extremely excited to see that. Anyway, sorry, I hijacked your topic. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's all good. Because one of the biggest things I found with fairly extended use with the Oculus is when you want to start doing more things, a keyboard and mouse is not ideal believe me freaking love keyboard and mouse but when you have an oculus on your face and you do a 180 in your chair it's not really going to work out so well <laughs> you can't be like uh we need I wireless oculus we really need wireless we need oculus. wireless oculus for one or we need some type of cable management system that can swivel with you oh okay where it's like oh you know what could probably be done even now and this is going to sound super dorky, but think about this. If you could get, um, like, even something crazy like Edsel's 2600 milliamp hour battery pack. Like, if you carry, like, if you had, like, a, 
like almost a backpack spaced battery, yep. whether it's DC or AC, depending on how you would power all the other stuff. And then a wireless HDMI kit, which are actually, you can get them for around a hundred or 200 bucks these days. That could be a pretty good DIY. There's, people have been doing concept art of the whole idea. They've been thinking of backpacks that were specially yep. made for it so that they're, they don't stick out way too far. Right. So they're slim lining against your back and different stuff like that with big flat battery. Yeah. Brilliant. So something like that coming out, um, better guns, which are more realistic coming out so that you could have, so you could have mags on your belt oh. and you take one out and put it like drop it or do whatever. And then, or put it in your belt and then take another one, load it in. And that's how you reload your gun. Uh, stuff like that would be fantastic. Just all these different accessories, which will make it so much better. And then something like an Omni so that you don't have to sit in this chair with a keyboard and mouse. Cause right now that's the most awkward thing is not yeah. the Oculus. It's all the other things you have to do with the Oculus paired with the resolution issues. So once the resolution issues are solved and all these accessories come out, this could be freaking awesome. Oh man, I'm stoked. <laughs> Jeez. So stoked that you don't even have to get an Oculus for Christmas to make it the central part of your Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'll just bring it there. <laughs> Speaking of more extremely exciting news, Steam OS is available today. We've actually, we're, we're gonna make this one of our main discussion points with Anand when he arrives. So I don't wanna get too much into it, but uh, we can talk about Steam OS. Actually, I mean, I guess it's slightly different. I'll be talking with him about Steam Box, mm. not Steam OS. Yeah. But a Steam Box is just a box with Steam OS on it and hardware in it. So <laughs> anyway, this was posted by Guns Cool on the forum and the original article is from The Verge with um, basically just an announcement that Steam OS will be available to download on Lucky Friday the 13th. And beyond that, Valve is shipping out those 300 prototype Steam Boxes that they had, whoops, I'm on the wrong scene here, that they had promised and uh, a few lucky people are getting a very early look at SteamOS and Steambox. Now, to be clear, um, they're not really recommending that people just run out, download SteamOS, and then chuck it on any old PC, unless they're experienced Linux hacks or people that are, that are pretty good at that sort of thing already, because it is not ready at all plus the learning curve will be a little bit steeper than if you're just installing Windows, where it's just like, put in USB, press OK, press OK, press OK, enter a product key and you're done. I'm, th I'm thinking that if, if it becomes available, like I haven't, I haven't seen, if someone has a download link for it, like I've gone to the SteamOS page and it says download will be available soon. I don't know if that's actually where they're releasing it because it's in beta. So if someone has the proper download page, if you could tweet it to me or spam it in chat or something, that would be awesome. And I might try and see if I can tinker with it and if I can get it working easily enough over the weekend. Do you think we should do benchmarks or do you think we should wait for the official release? You know what? I am actually less interested in benchmarking SteamOS from a local play perspective. Okay. Yeah. And I am more interested in benchmarking SteamOS from a network play perspective. But that should work. It should. Yeah. So that, but uh, to me... Building the powerful Steam box doesn't actually make a ton of sense no. if network play works well, yeah. which I don't see why it wouldn't. And we're so close to consumer grade 10 gigabit LAN that we could be looking at, with compression, 4K streaming by the time 4K TVs are really available and affordable and good. Mm -hmm. um, so with all of that in mind, I just don't think we need powerful graphics cards in these things. So no. Um, what I would like to take a look at more than anything else is the latency yep, of yep, the definitely. network streaming. So I actually, all the things I got today, <laughs> I got so much cool stuff today, you guys. Uh, we got a new lens from Sigma. It's a 24 to 105, I think, 24 to 105 millimeter lens. It's an F4. Um, the sharpness should be just outstanding. Some of their new stuff has been great. We got our 4K recorder for the Sony FS700 camera. So we are ready to rock with a sharp new lens and our 4K recorder. Huh, so excited about that. Um, I got, okay, this, I mean, I guess it doesn't sound as exciting as that stuff, but this is the one I was about to say, was I got a USB to gigabit ethernet adapter for my shield. So, that, what's up? Um, you seem just, concerned. It's, it's, what? The title's wrong, that's all, keep it's going. It's not wrong. Well, okay, I guess we should say we're live now, fine. Um, so, right, so I got a USB to gigabit ethernet adapter. So that means I'm gonna be able to run NVIDIA Shield in 1080p mode on my TV, rather than relying on wireless and being limited to 720p. So what we can do is because we just picked up one of these babies, yeah, that's right, 
And because we have a shield, and because, if you can figure it out, we'll have SteamOS set up, we could actually look at these different streaming solutions, which I really think is the future. Not necessarily streaming over the WAN, over the internet, but streaming to yourself, to all your devices locally, is extremely exciting to me. Extremely? Get it? Oh. Is, ext <laughs> is extremely exciting to me, and I'd like to have a look at how all these oh. solutions are comparing to each other. So stay tuned, guys. That is definitely something that we're going to be looking into later. Okay, apparently we do have a link, and you can download SteamOS right now. That's so ghetto. That's it's awesome. It's super ghetto, like, FTP, <laughs> like, oh, wow, that's amazing. I, I love you, Valve. All oh, right. Wow. So let's get into our first headline topic. I actually don't even, I don't even think this qualifies as a headline topic. I mean, come on, man. Oh, I'm stoked. But it, it's more like a rapid fire topic, but we're just turning it into a headline topic because, because whatever. Because it's awesome. All right, so this was posted by Nice Hat on the forum. Microsoft's new smart bra stops you from emotionally overeating. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so... All right, all right, okay, so hold on, hold on. Let's let's be mature for a second here, Luke. <laughs> Can we be mature for a second? What, I say the word boobies and you laugh? Is that how this works? I actually didn't laugh at that. No, but brassiere? No. Nope. Smart bra? Nope. Not even uh, smart bra. <laughs> <laughs> so smart bra, that's where you draw the line, okay. So oh. it actually has a control board on it. It has sensors for detecting your stress levels as <sighs> well as your heart rates. And, um, okay, ba basically, it's a wearable stress sensor. And you know, okay, I'm all for wearable tech. And if it did something else, I would probably be like, oh, that's pretty cool. But it tells you to stop eating, <laughs> which is like, really? Now, hold on a second. Now, oh the, the, claim, the claim right now, so the designer, when asked about a male version, because it's like, what, so only women need to stop eating? Is that what you're trying to say? Okay, so... The designer said her team did try to develop a version for men, but that male underwear is too far away from the heart for an accurate EKG rating. <laughs> so basically, it'll only work for I mean, unless men could wear brassiers, then, then it would work, in theory. Yeah. But then you could just buy the ladies' version as long as they don't make it just sort of pink and frilly. I mean, okay, wearable tech, extremely exciting, but I think for now to put the amount of processing power into something to make it legitimately useful. We're gonna be looking at this kind of wearable tech or this kind of wearable tech and not so much socks and brassieres and all that kind of stuff. It, okay, if they had a, a smart brassier so that you, it, it could tell your phone your heart rate, but well, it didn't. Can. But it didn't bleed out going, oh my God, you're eating too much. <laughs> that would make so much more sense to me. If it was affordable, that okay, that's fine. Cause you could, Hey, if it was a sports bra, you could track your heart rate while running. Okay, so and you wouldn't you, have to wear any extra stuff. So you don't mind if it's a piece of athletic gear. I have. I don't even care if it's a piece of personal gear. It doesn't matter. I just. I think it's kind of insane that it's like because it, one, it's going to go off at all the wrong times. I already yeah. brought this up with you. You're going to be in a movie. You're going to be enjoying the movie and get really into it, and your heart rate's going to go up. And, and you're like, you're like going to take eating. a bite of popcorn, and it's going to be like, yeah. Bzz, 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 you're bzz. overstressed. Stop eating. Do you think it's it like, vibrates? No. Do you think it texts your phone? No. How do you think it works? You don't think it, it vibrates? It, it communicates with your phone. It doesn't vibrate. You could keep your phone in your bra. You could. And then that could vibrate. Yes. All right. <laughs> but like, yeah, you're going to be at a movie, you're going to be eating, and then it's going to freak out. So the original article was from Extreme Tech. I, th I think I had forgotten to say that before. want to make sure that giving credit where credit is due. And I, I, I don't even... You know what, guys? Hit us on the Twitter Blitz for this one. Let's, yeah, uh, let's yeah. do a Twitter Blitz right after this topic, uh, right after this next topic and before Anand joins us because it's... Just tell us your thoughts in 140 characters or less. <laughs> Linus Tech on Twitter. And I think that's about all we have to say. So let's do one of our... Um, Let's do one of our rapid fire topics here. We've actually got quite a few. You know what? This is something that was news, apparently. If, if you press enter right after it, it turns into a link. Yeah, that's good that it does that because that's annoying. Um, <laughs> it's a lot better than Excel where you have to actually highlight it into the <laughs> field of it's like ridiculous. Okay, so this was posted on Linus Tech Tips Forum and apparently I'm on page two. Oh no, here we go. So by Snow Comet, Sony announced a micro USB thumb drive uh, for Android devices that is small enough to carry at all times. It has a 
standard USB connector on one end, so you can see standard USB here, so that goes right into your port, and then has micro USB on the other end. It has on-the-go functionality, meaning that on Android 4.0.3 or later, apparently 4.4 is not yet supported, so that's kind of interesting, uh, you can have 8 gigs, 16 gigs, or 32 gigs of storage available to you. And the interesting to me thing to me about this was that this already exists, but for some reason when Sony does it, it's making, you know, headlines, and when Patriot does it, um, we're the only ones who apparently know. We've actually got a sample of the Stellar already. So if my, uh, if my internet would go a little bit faster here, I would be able to show that to you guys. But basically, it's pretty much the same thing, and it's available in up to 64 gigs. So Patriot has the jump on Sony for that particular thing. Speaking of your internet not going fast enough, we might be getting some awesomeness on Tuesday. Or wait, like, we are getting some awesomeness on Tuesday, or we might be? We getting? are. They're we coming. Are. They're coming. We are getting some awesomeness They're coming. on Tuesday. <laughs> I watched The Hobbit last night, so it's like... <laughs> it's just total flashbacks. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Anyway. So anyway, were, were you going to tell them what's coming on Tuesday? Or no? Well, I, I was, you know more about it than I do. Oh, well, basically, we have a new internet connection coming in. It's going to be 50 meg down, which who cares? But compared to our 5 meg up that we have now on cable, we are going to have 10 meg up on fiber. And we're probably like the only people in the area on fiber. Ooh. And I think the company yeah, that we're yeah, going yeah, through doesn't yeah. do shared connections. Ooh. No, they don't. Da -da -da -da. So you should I, have seen, he was on the phone, and he like, moves the phone away from his house, or house, head, and freaks out and like, falls to the floor and is all excited, and then all of a sudden goes like, yep, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was a fiber connection, no, because <clears throat> that service is not fiber in every area. It just happens to be fiber yes, here? Yes, because it's, it's ADSL plus in a lot of places. And, but they still have that service, but it's like, you know how it's always advertised max 10 meg, but whatever? Yeah, yeah. Our area, like, I called the general line and they had to transfer me to, like, the fiber team in order to get it set up. Like, our area's Sweet. fiber. That's awesome. So I'm, like, super stoked. I just made sure all your links were hyperlinked for the future. Oh, so thank you. to go. I appreciate that. And if I'm, your I internet am, was working, that would be fantastic. I am, like, super trying to do this, but I am, like, super not having a ton of success. And Patriot's SEO is super not terrific. So between all of those super things going on right now, there's not a whole lot I can do to show you guys the Stellar. Unless I can! There it is! Woo! Oh, really? Seriously? Oh yeah, there we go, there we go. Okay, so this is the Stellar, you guys. So just like the Sony one, it's got a micro USB on one end, and then it has full-size USB 3, which is even better than the Sony one on the other end, available in three different sizes, 16, 32, and 64, and it is on the go ready. In fact, just as a quick test, I plugged it into the bottom of my one, and it worked flawlessly. They also have the Cosmos, which is um, not a USB thumb drive, it's different. It is a... Please have your site work. Thank you. <laughs> Cosmos, which is an on-the-go, so it has USB 2 on one end and micro USB on the other end, uh, SD card and micro SD card reader. So this one's actually kind of cool because you're not just limited to the storage, it's limited to the storage. It's actually on the device itself. You could just carry around like a Pelican case full of SD cards, yep. and then you could carry all the data with you if you were obsessive compulsive enough to actually manage like transferring everything and like archiving it all on SD. So yeah. I thought that was pretty cool as well. All right, so let's see what uh, let's see what the Twitterverse has to say about wearable smart bras. There's a bunch of people in the chat making fun of us for being all excited over an internet connection that is apparently not even that good. I know it's not that good, but this is Canada, guys! And it's like twice as good as our current one yeah, to upload. Yeah, it's twice as good as the best plan we can get from our current providers, so <laughs> whatever, man. Still stoked. Yeah, I mean, imagine if you can program the bra, as Dimitru here says, imagine if you could program the bra like you can program GPS with, like, different voices voice. like, and, like, different attitudes. That's horrible. It's like, you know, the uh, that episode of Futurama uh. where they reprogram the ship's computer from being, like you know, an irritating dude that Bender always argues with to being, like, a seductive female. Mm. So you could take your bra anywhere from, like, you could dial it to, like, supportive girlfriend, and it's like, hey, hon, you know, you probably shouldn't grab that. And then you could dial it all the way to, like, abusive boyfriend. It's like, hey, 
If you eat one more of those, I'm leaving you. Or something. That's horrible. It's sort of horrible. See, it's just gonna help anorexia, which is like not good. If it just tracked like your heart rate and like other things and gave you statistics so you could like follow your thing and like if, if it helped like health apps and all that kind of stuff like that could be really cool but hater hater, hater right here on the stream zorbot's always a hater i know what a hater literally always a hater uh we're getting it's uh telus fiber so i know it's telus so all the promises in the world we'll see but anyway um i bet bill gates put a camera in the bra i i bet he didn't i bet he has better things to do <laughs> that would be a lot nicer than using weird on the go cables indeed we mini? What? I, I haven't even heard of this. No one has even taught... Hashtag boobies? Really? That was the best you could come up with? <laughs> Apparently, I am getting Justin through finals week with this stream. It's like a chain, man. I am... I am... I, I don't think this stream will help you with your finals. No. Although, if he has, like, scheduled breaks so that he can stay focused... Schedule breaks at 4.30 on Fridays exactly for anywhere from one and a half to two and a half hours. <laughs> that was so specific. All right. Oh, there's a better way to download SteamOS through the unofficial torrent. So guys, check that unofficial out as long as that is... Kinda... Yeah, whatever. But although it's on steamdb.info. So yeah, it's probably, it's probably fine. fine. Watching from work, I could feel the judgment from you just leaving the bra picture up. Yeah, we are definitely judging that idea. Um, how do you plan to prevent SteamOS spam in the Twitch chat? We're not. We're not. It seems to be fine already. Yeah, I guess Windows and Steam will unite to provide the world the first game streaming bra app. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so basically people don't have much to say about the smart bra, no which opinions. I guess shouldn't surprise us that much. All right, so we've got our special. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Finally one. I believe MS said the smart bra would be for other purposes. Health apps are already a thing and more data could be useful for them. All right, so more data for the health apps that already exist. Okay, fine. But I mean, I just don't, the level of, I, okay, I don't see it happening anytime soon. The, that part I do agree with though. Yep. If it interfaces with your phone and helps currently existing health apps, that sure. totally makes sense. Yelling at you for eating too much, I don't think is the right angle. <laughs> that doesn't seem like a good idea. <laughs> You're probably just creating a problem. So terrible. Yeah. All right, so we have a special guest yep. joining us. Do I have headphones? You do. They're over here. You are amazing. Uh, Slick set up the stream all by his big boy self today, and I, I am extremely impressed what? so far with how well it's working. <laughs> well, remember when you used to set it up and the audio never worked? Well, that's because we had the worst audio setup on the planet. I love our new audio setup. And if I had enough time, it worked the best we ever had it working. It's so great. Just saying. Yeah, well. But this one's kind of nice because it just kind of works instantaneously. You yeah. You don't have to like, spend literally two hours trying to balance everything. Yeah, it's great. All right, I'm dragging him up. All right. User was moved to your channel. I hope he's ready. I am ready. Hey, how are you? Welcome to the show. I'm doing all right. Thanks for, thanks for having me. That, this is absolutely fantastic. So, all right, I'm going to start. I'm, I'm actually, sorry, I, I know I just brought you in, but I, I actually have to not let you talk for just a moment here because not everyone would have necessarily seen the intro. So, guys, I'm introducing Anand from Anantech right here. This is his head right here. You'll be hearing his melodic voice in your heads, or at least you'll think it's melodic if you're anywhere near as much of a fanboy of this guy as I am. <laughs> now, I did an interview of him. I'm, gonna, I'm totally probably making you blush, so it's a good thing there's no video feed but i did an interview of him at computex that my staff hid the footage from me and wouldn't allow me to upload because apparently it was just about an hour of me gushing about his greatness but now we're live and so there's nothing that they can do to prevent this from being broadcast to the entire internet so anan is the guy who got me into tech more than anyone else. I've read almost everything he's ever written and I have a lot of respect for this guy. So normally I ask my guests to introduce themselves, but I think I've probably introduced you a fair bit here. Do you have anything else to say? No, you, this is like super kind of you. Um, and <laughs> so no, I've, I've nothing to add. This is, this is awesome. And congratulations, by the way, you've been like making waves and, and clearly uh, putting in a lot of good work and it's good to see that you, uh, you get recognized for that. Well, thank you very much. I think that leads pretty well into our very first topic here. Now, you were, uh, I mean, okay, I remember asking you this question, but I'm going to make you answer it. I'm going to make you answer it on air. You always wear a suit, even in Taipei, in the middle of summer. 
can you talk about the origins of Anantech and a little bit about the print to digital media transition and how you've experienced it and lived through it? Yeah, totally. Um, okay, so the suit has a couple of things. Um, so I, I started, when I started the site, I was 14. And uh, I don't know, my parents always raised me to believe that when you do something important, you wear a suit. So I was, I don't know, meeting with people and I figured got to wear a suit. Um, so I did that for a while. And then at some point, I guess I, I stopped being a kid, but I kept with the whole suit thing. Um, because one thing I realized was a lot of the other folks um, that were you know, in the industry doing similar things weren't necessarily doing things as professionally as I thought that they should be doing them. Um, so I, I use the suit as kind of a way to, to at least when I walk in a room to, to help explain that, look, we're here to work. Um, I mean, since then, the, you know, industry's consolidated, things have like calmed down a bit, but um, the suit always kind of stayed. Um, now, every now and then I do slip up. Like, uh, I mean, it went, I probably went like a decade without anyone ever seeing me outside of a suit. Cause like, that's not how I dress at home. Like I'm not wearing a suit right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I kept the facade going for like a really, really long time. And then one time I, I think I was speaking at maybe a QuakeCon or something like that. And I remember getting out of uh, a car and I was like in basketball shorts. I hadn't shaved in days. <laughs> And I think some people from AMD saw me and they're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and so since then, you know, I've kind of, I've kind of slacked a bit. Like, no, I won't wear like dress shoes anymore. Right. I'll wear sneakers. Cause like, I don't know, I review really cool stuff and it like blows my mind how they're able to do all of this, but my feet have to hurt at the end of a trade show. So I'm not okay with that. So I, I, I ditched the dress shoes. I'll, I'll usually wear the suit a few times. Like I'll, I'm, I'm an old dude now, right? Like I'll, I'll not wear a tie sometimes and just like really slack off. Um, okay, so that answers the suit question. Uh, yeah. Origins of an on tech. Um, long story short, I was like, uh, I don't know, my parents are teachers, we didn't have a ton of money. Um, I needed a new computer. My dad was like, hey, just build one because back then you could save a lot of money doing that. Right. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. So I flipped through computer shopper pointed at stuff and and you know, we ordered things and I put it together. And of course, I shorted the motherboard to the chassis. So I killed the motherboard. My dad's like, you're done. Um, my mom's like, no, 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 it's okay. We'll, we'll get you another motherboard. Um, totally like piece of crap motherboard too. Had like fake cash on it, the whole thing. Um, so I built that and I'm like, Hey, this is kind of cool. I have a new computer. Um, and I learned a lot in the process. Uh, my dad's, uh, he was a teacher at a college at the time and, um, other faculty and students were in a similar situation. So this was like seventh ish grade for me. He would like pick me up after school and I'd go around and build people computers. Um, and then, you know, they'd have problems with their computers, so I'd go around and fix them. Um, so I did that for like two years, and then 97 hit, and both my parents being teachers, I had this like bug to want to teach and share knowledge. Uh, so I kind of brain dumped online, and, and that's where we started. Um, on, a, on a GeoCities page, right? Yep, geocities.com slash, uh, I think slash Silicon Valley slash Pine slash 9297. That was the URL. <laughs> um, nice. So yeah, I did that, and... Uh, I, I, I don't know, I was 14. I didn't know what I was doing. I just wanted to share thoughts. And uh, I hadn't really thought about the whole print to internet transition. Um, and actually, you know, I, I was doing it for years when, you know, print was still on this this pedestal. And, you know, it was just you're the you're the online guys or, or you're the online guy that wears a suit. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it took a while for that transition from from print to digital to, to really become a holy crap, we need to do this um, kind of thing. Uh, and, and I would say that that really probably happened in the in the past handful of years, um, where, you know, you go through the past recession, uh, you know, where everyone gets hit advertising wise, um, and you know, the, the print guys got hit the worst. Right. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, you could point to that point as well, you know, you had better have jumped by now because other, otherwise you're going to have a, a difficult time or hope you have a lot of money. So another question I had for you, you know, I guess so for you, the, the long and short of that is right place, right time as far as the, the, the brilliant idea of starting up a website in order to get your thoughts out there about PCs as opposed to trying to make a magazine or whatever else. But Well, so I would, I would add right place, right time, right age. Um, cause w one thing I do is I, I talk to, um, I, I go around and talk to like kids in high school. That was a very formulative period of, of my life. And, uh, I had a very unique high school career where, uh, 
you know, I was in school, I was on TV and, and, you know, I was also working with, you know, all these amazing companies and learning a lot. Uh, and one of the things that I, I like to tell kids is that, you know, those four years you have in high school, um, that's like a free ride, right? Like you get your work done, but those are your four years to get your way towards, you know, your, your 10,000 hours, right? You, you pick a passion, you pick something that you don't need to make money with, um, that you can just pour all your time into. You don't have to worry about hopefully like a rent or mortgage payment. You just dive into it and, and you know, work towards being an expert at something uh, so that when you step foot in college, you, you know, can go to learn and, and not necessarily go to hopefully one day start building a career. Right. That's actually a very, very good point and uh, something I wish I had done a little bit better on my path. I did not get started nearly as early as you. Um, so the the basis of an on tech at the beginning was of course PC, but over the last few years I've seen I've seen your interests shift and hence the articles that you're writing really shift towards things like home theater. You went on a bit of a kick, um, <laughs> a bit of a home theater kick for a little while. Um, you've moved a, away from PC strictly to doing a lot of first Mac coverage and then now um, iOS coverage, so Apple devices in general. And where do you see see Anantech heading in the future? I mean, you guys have, I mean, Brian Klug, if he's, if he's anywhere near you, please just yell at him and tell him how amazing he is when it comes to phone reviews. You guys have positioned yourselves through his hard work. I mean, sweat, blood, and tears goes into that as really, in my mind, the premier phone review site. But where, what do you think is the next step? I appreciate that. No, Brian isn't sitting next to me. He's uh, he's in Arizona right now working actually on another phone review. Um, but he uh, he's amazing. Like, I, I'm actually really, really proud of our entire team. Um, so it's interesting if you look at it through you, you kind of hit the nail on the head there. Yeah, right. Like um, a lot of our coverage does uh, or at least what I do kind of follows my interests. Um, you know, I was building a home theater. So I said, hey, maybe I should look in home theater PCs. And I remember walking into a compiler class in college. Uh, this was back in 02 or 03. I remember walking in uh, in the, uh, I guess this was in the College of Engineering building um, or maybe in the Computer Science building. So I walk in and I look around and everyone has a Mac laptop. And I'm like, this is really weird um, because, you know, for years, this just, you wouldn't see that. And uh, that was actually what inspired me to, to go out, buy a Mac, and, and start using that. Um, and, and that spawned, you know, our, our Mac coverage. Um, and then, you know, from there, you, you said it yourself, we, we branched out into mobile. What is interesting from my perspective is I, I don't actually view this as any different as what we, you know, did when I started, right? Like, it's all, we get into compute when it hits a, a certain level of sophistication, right? Um, right. And, you know, we our, our phone coverage kind of basically started with the iPhone um, back in 07. We, we had some false starts internally when we said, hey, you know, how do we grow? We need other things to do. Um, and, and, you know, we, we messed around with just kind of more regular phone reviews and, you know, playing around with PDAs and Windows Mobile and stuff like that. But none of those projects ever really got off the ground. And then, you know, we, we kind of tried again with the iPhone um, and that did relatively well. Um, and then, you know, a couple of years into it, we, we started adding more um and then definitely over the past i'd say three or four years um, we really ramped up our mobile coverage um but from my perspective they're all pcs right it's just a different box um and, yep. and you know it's a, a different cadence of release right because we do enterprise reviews as well but that's just like a really really big computer that comes out you know right. once every year or two I mean, I think that's something that um, that I, th I think the post PC era is such a misnomer because the sitting at a desk doing work uh, experience is not going to go away. I mean, this is much like a, a bit of an, a back and forth argument that I've had with my viewers over the last little while, where I said that the PS4 and the Xbox One are the last generation of consoles as we know them, and I'd have people telling me, well, what, I'm not going to game on my couch anymore? No, that's not what I'm saying. The couch gaming experience is not going anywhere, it's just that the console is going somewhere. So in much the same way that the ex sitting at a desk with a big monitor and getting real work done isn't going anywhere, I think the device that we do it on is the thing that might just be changing over the next five to 10 years. And it's just, they're all PCs. Just Yeah. And cause that's, I mean, I would, I would say the same thing on a console, right? Like if you look at, you know, 360 PS3, PS4, Xbox one, it's just PCs. It's their like really weird PCs that are made by Microsoft and Sony, but they're just PCs. Um, and you know, how, how well valve does with Steambox over the next decade, I think will will ultimately determine whether or not we get another console refresh. So um, let's talk about weird PCs with Steambox because that's our next topic. 
Very nice segue, okay. by the way. Um, Digital Storm has given some details on their upcoming Steam OS slash Windows. So they're planning to preload both OSs on it from what I've seen, but I guess you could probably opt out of Windows. Um, so this is a gaming box with liquid cooling on the CPU up to a 700 watt power supply. Um, it's gonna be around $1,500, have a, have a powerful graphics card in it. Um, and then the other end of the spectrum, we've got guys like iBuyPower with their $500 machine that's going to have, I think it was an R, R9270 or something along those lines, like a much more uh, middle-of-the-road graphics card. Where do you see SteamOS and Steambox? Which, to be clear for the viewers, guys, a Steambox is just a computer, in much the same way that all the other things we're talking about are just computers, that happens to run SteamOS. It's just, it's just a box that you bought from someone that is validated and preloaded with SteamOS. That's all the Steam boxes. So how do you see Steam box fitting in with the current consoles and with PC moving forward? Um, okay, so uh, it's a really, really good idea. Um, it's actually, I was at a, uh, a dinner, um, a, like a secret Intel Larrabee dinner, which I guess I can talk about now because Larrabee never happened for consumers. Um, so Is it okay? Dinner. Hold on a second. Is it okay to reveal a secret that never truly fully got revealed? I mean, they, they announced it, right? It's just, <laughs> yeah, I was never supposed it, to talk about this dinner, but I'm going to talk about the dinner now. So <laughs> All right. and, um, it's not actually like it's now I've hyped it up too much. The dinner, it, it doesn't. I mean, it was a great dinner. It's just it's irrelevant to the current conversation. The food was um, good. Yeah, I know. It was actually, yeah, it was, it was an entertaining dinner. Anyways, Charlie from Semi Accurate, he was, he was at the dinner. And he floats this idea of, um, and this is years ago, right? Like Larrabee time frame, like pre a lot of stuff. Um, so he floats this idea that, you know, AMD and Intel should get together, develop a list of specs and make, you know, develop a little badge program and make hardware vendors go out, meet the specs and, you know, they can distribute like an OS, like a little virtualized or like a hypervisor or something like that, um, like on a USB stick. Um, and this would be like a very custom console gaming OS that would, that would run on this hypervisor. Uh, and you'd have this logo program, which would ensure that you would meet the right specs and, and Sorry, that you could can play. Sorry, I, can I interrupt you for a second? Do you yeah, want to explain to the viewers who don't know what hypervisor is, sort of what that would mean exactly? Oh, true. Yeah, sure. Um, basically a thing that you can run multiple virtualized OSs on. Um, so you, you would run, uh, so like if you have a Mac, how you can run Windows on it, right? So like you'll, your VMware will be your hypervisor and then Windows will be, you know, your, uh, uh, if you run Windows alongside OS 10, like in OS 10, effectively, um, but basically you look at it like this, or actually the OS that um, the Xbox One runs, right? So it has a hypervisor that runs the Xbox gaming OS as well as the the Windows kernel side by side, um, okay. and you know you switch between them. Anyway, so this is his idea, and and I heard it, and I'm like this is amazing. This is exactly what we need to do because the console model of Hey, you know, you got a, a certain amount of money has to go to the publisher, a certain amount of money has to go to, you know, you know, the the owner of the platform. Yeah. Like that's all silly. Like there's no reason to have that anymore because we have the internet and we have Steam, and you know, Steam handles distribution for you. And at that time, if you looked at what was happening to PC gaming, I remember I walked into a Best Buy one day and I was like, Well, where are all the PC games? And <laughs> it like worried me, right? Because it was kind of this started happening right before Steam picked up a lot of Steam, right? Like before it, yeah. it got really, really good where, you know, you don't have to worry about PC gaming anymore. Um, and, and it was worrisome to me. So I heard this idea and I'm like, oh, this is amazing. This is the exact way to save PC gaming. Um, and it was a great idea, but, but you know, nothing ever came of it. And then, you know, Valve starts talking about Steam OS and Steambox. And I'm like, oh, this is amazing. This is exactly what he was talking about years ago. And I believe in it. Um, I, I think it's a really, really good idea. The the wrinkle in all of this is, can you get killer titles ported over to Linux? Um, and the answer probably gonna, is yes. I'm going to argue it doesn't matter. That's that's going to be that's going to be sort of my my take on all this because if Valve can implement their streaming the way that they're saying that they can. Like if I'm going to be able to stream 1080p or, you know, a couple of years from now when we're looking at 10 gigabit home networking over Cat6 being something that people can feasibly do, if all of a sudden we can stream 1080p or 4K from some other device within the house, whether that's a Windows-based gaming PC or whatever else it happens to be in the future, then I would make the argument that 
whether the game runs natively on SteamOS or not becomes irrelevant. And the, uh, the, Steam, the Steam box, in its, in its best form to me, is almost just a thin client that acts as a streaming box from whatever else happens to be in your house. I mean, for me, I think the first thing I thought when I heard about NVIDIA Grid was not um, playing games over the internet. The first thing that I thought was, holy crap, I'd love to get one of those for like a land center or for my house so that every PC in my house, whether it runs an Atom with onboard Intel graphics or whether it runs whatever other high-end stuff, you know, dual GTX Titans, is able to have a fantastic gaming experience. So that that's my take on it and maybe like, let me know what you think. Do we? Does it matter? Linux compatibility for the games. So you may bring up a really good point, um, but I so I separate that from because at that okay. point then you don't need SteamOS, right? All you need is like a, a a sync, right? Like you just need a wireless sync for you know that connects to your TV. And, and I'm guessing you know Nvidia has already kind of done that with Shield, and mm -hmm. I'm guessing there'll be. Uh, if you play in that space, you know, chances are you'll want to build a similar device, right? So that's that's kind of independent of, in my eyes, of Steam OS being a success or not, um, right? Because like you can you can build and deliver that experience today, right? Like there's no yeah. you don't need anything else. Um, what I'm what I'm looking at Steam OS being successful at is can you duplicate the console model, right? Can you get to the point where someone who knows not doesn't own a gaming PC, like he just runs like Word on his notebook from ten years ago, um, can that guy or girl go out and say, Hey, I want this. I don't want an Xbox, I don't want a PlayStation, I want this, I don't I don't know what PC gaming is, I don't know what Steam is, but this is what I want in my living room. Like, can they get to that point? Um and and you know if you uh you you were at the montreal thing weren't you yeah i was yeah so if you listen to uh, you know all those guys up there carmack sweeney the, you know they all said hey this is a crazy idea give it 10 years and, and you know maybe it'll work um if they can get to that ease of use model right i i think it could definitely definitely replace uh consoles the issue though is if we're talking about a 10-year horizon before this thing's successful that that does leave room for another another go from the the traditional console players if they made it so that there was a a version or a model or a type of steam box that you could buy that was by default automatically launched into uh big picture mm -hmm. and just put you directly into big picture and did not really take you out i think that could bridge that gap but if it launched directly into steam os it could be a little bit foreign because you're sitting in Linux, right? And the other thing that the other thing that bothers me a little bit um, from from Valve, like I understand why Valve's doing this because they need to cater to the traditional PC gaming market. They can't they can't tell those guys, yeah, hey, <laughs> I know you thought we were cool before, but we're gonna just we're gonna lock down Steambox hardware, and there's gonna be one hardware configuration. There's gonna be a reference design, just like a tra traditional console. We're gonna refresh it every three years or whatever else. Um, I don't think anyone would have accepted that. But the issue is that one of the major complaints that you get from a diehard console player is I don't want to upgrade my hardware every year or every two years and I don't want to worry about GTX this or Radeon that that happens to be on the box. I want to, or inside the box, I want to go to Best Buy, I want to buy the thing with the price tag under it, there's one price tag, there's one thing, I want to take it home, I want to put my game in it, and I want to have the experience that all my buddies are having. Whereas I think opening up the hardware to just anything um, is not the strategy that we've seen work so well for companies like Microsoft with the Xbox or like Apple with the iPhone and the iPad where it's this tightly integrated experience that they're managing. I mean, something that Apple does so well is no iPhone will ever ship with a crappy wireless chipset from some no-name, whereas it will be possible for people to buy a Steam box with off-brand audio components or yeah. wireless components and have a bad experience and blame it on SteamOS or on Steambox rather than on the true the true culprit. And I think that by trying to target a less tech-savvy audience, you open yourself up to that. So I, I'd agree with that. Um, but I would say that those are like, that's something you can easily mitigate, right? So, you know, Microsoft tries to do this with, you know, the Windows hardware approval process, right? It's just that they set the bar so low that everyone <laughs> can play. I mean, they have to, right? They're like, well, no, we need to sell Windows because otherwise we can't, we need Windows. Um, whereas <laughs> Valve isn't in that position, right? So if I'm at Valve, you know, you just go hardcore about it, right? We'll give you, you know, you want this official Steam box logo or whatever, you have to not ship like just terrible hardware. Um, 
So I, I think that's a, that's something that you can get around. Um, you know, big picture mode. It's I, I actually wrote about this in our Gsync coverage that it seems like there are a lot of individual projects um, that are out in in the PC gaming world right now. Uh, that if we just polished them all up, we would be we'd be very close to like a, a hyper console experience, right? So something that's even, you know, it used to be that, hey, consoles, they were simple. You didn't need to worry about installing your game and, yeah. and updates and none of that. But like Remember now, cartridges? I, no loading yeah. screens. <laughs> no, and now it's like, well, you got to put in the disc and like wait three and a half minutes <laughs> because it has to install. And like there's a disc. So like now it's a, it's a there's very... There's an update. <laughs> yeah, and it's not... all The whole premise of this being an easy to use different thing like it has a web browser now it's just it's no longer what a console used to be it's just a managed pc now um so i feel like if you look at you look at geforce experience right yeah that's that's a way of abstracting the whole you have to define settings um which yeah. works right you look at steam's big picture mode that gets away from you know there's a window desktop a windows desktop in the background yeah. um and then you look at technologies like gsync and now you're getting into this realm of well, not only does it look better, have cheaper games and, you know, whatever compared to a console, but like it's actually also smoother too, right? Like yes. this is like, this is, it's, it's insane. So we have all of these like little things, but all of them need polish, right? Because big picture mode is close, but it's still kind of valvey, it's you know? not quite there. And G-Sync <laughs> yeah. is locked down to NVIDIA hardware and Mantle. I mean, they're saying it's not locked down, but I, I think it'll be a cold day in hell before NVIDIA... Um, gets on board with Project Mantle. And so all these things, it's just like you're saying, they need to all kind of come together. Um, but this this segues really well into our next topic, which is G-Sync. Now, I've got a G-Sync monitor here as well, the same one you have. Um, so I've played with it myself, but I read almost everything you write, regardless of whether I've already got one and I've already got my own impressions of it formed as well anyway. So I did notice that you were the one who did the G-Sync article for your website. Um, you did, I guess you were, was it because you were particularly excited about it or, um, you know, did you just want to make sure that it was done a hundred percent right? The article was great. Give me your, your thoughts in, I guess, verbal form, as opposed to asking everyone to necessarily read the article, although they definitely should. It's only about four pages. How important is G-Sync for the future of PC gaming and just for the future of better image quality in general? Yeah, so um, I I don't know. I did, it's no, there's no like big story as to why I was the one that wrote it. And Nvidia was like, "Hey, uh, we're sending you a monitor." And I was like, "Hey, yeah, I'm busy. I have like stuff to do." And no, I know you have to. It doesn't. I don't care. Just <laughs> just take the monitor. <laughs> so so yeah, that that was the the long story of that. Um, so what do I think of G Sync? Um, I was kind of expecting it to just like completely like just suck. Right, because I saw it in Montreal, <laughs> and I you you saw it there, and like what they showed was impressive, right? Like I yeah. looked at it, I'm like this is good, definitely. Um, but they showed it in the Pendulum demo, and like I couldn't really play with it. And... Yeah, and Tomb Raider in that one spot where you stood next to that one mountain, <laughs> that's yeah. like, <laughs> and you pan around the character at two yeah. different speeds. I was just like, come on, guys. <laughs> Exactly. I'm like, come on, this is not... I, so I'm fully expecting it to just be miserable. And for like the first day, day and a half, that's that was my experience. Um, I, I kind of mentioned it in the review. Yeah. Uh, I had this um, this Titan system, uh, the the Tiki from Falcon Northwest that, that you yeah. know, I got when the Titan launched. And dude, like the thing was just like hard lock um, whenever just I did anything. And when I could get it to be stable, like I totally wiped the machine, did a brand new install Windows 8.1, latest drivers, whatever. Uh, and, and whenever I just even running benchmarks, when I could get them to run on this Titan, they were running like slower than the, the GTX 760. So I, at first, and, and you know, I, I have um, Dell's 24 uh, inch 4K here. So I switch monitors and switch the monitors and every, all the problems go away. Everything's fine. So at first I thought, right. well, this, is, this thing sucks. Um, and then I had a uh, GTX 660 Ti uh, on a different test bed. Plug it in, the thing won't even like post. Like I don't even, there's no nothing out of the display. So I'm like, okay, this is really, really bad. Um, and then, you know, a third time's a charm, I had a, a GTX 760 from EVGA and uh, worked perfectly. So uh, when I got to that point, I was really, really worried. But no, it, it literally worked in everything. Like there were no issues. I, I never ran into... Uh, any like weird hiccups or visual glitches or anything like that. Um, 
it all worked and it worked and looked just as good as it did in Montreal, which was kind of amazing. Um, it was frustrating to me that the pendulum demo doesn't let you, it doesn't deal with any scenario greater than uh, 60 frames a second. Like I can't do right. any of the 120 or 144 testing there. Um, that was kind of frustrating, but yeah. I spent a lot of time playing games, which, um, I don't get time to do anymore. Um, so that was kind of cool. Um, and I don't know. I posted some videos that kind of show the effect. Uh, it, it, you know, makes me hate tearing a lot. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I thought there was a there was a substantial benefit to to using this versus VSync on. Um, obviously, a substantial benefit versus uh, you know VSync off. Less pronounced of a benefit versus VSync off at a really high refresh rate. Um, right. Which I think that's a. That's a key thing for you know any hardcore gamers right now that are already running at 144 or 120. Um, there's still an advantage. It's just not nearly as pronounced as it is at 60. Well, um, to me, to me the issue here. Sorry, do you, do you mind? Yeah. No, no, go for it. Okay. To me, the issue here is a, a couple of things. So number one is that Nvidia shipped their G-Sync evaluation monitor. Um, and it's a one, it's a 1080p panel, and it's a 144 hertz panel. And I, I don't find it much the same way that, that you didn't see as much of a difference there. I don't find that at extremely high refresh rates, it is as huge and night and day of a difference as it is at you know 60 frames per second. And Nvidia knows that. And then number two is that because it's only a 1080p monitor in modern games with a decent graphics card, because the 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 pace at which graphics cards have been improving in performance has really begun to slow down even uh, you know a last generation card like a 660 ti can run most modern games and not really worry too much at dipping below 60 frames per second unless you're cranking up details that begin to not really affect image quality unless you're doing side by side screenshot comparisons and 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 peering at them with a magnifying glass um so to me that the issue is that they shipped completely the wrong product to showcase it. And I think that if they had shipped a 1440p panel, so something that can actually, um, if there's something that runs at a resolution where it's going to demand more of a GTX 780 or a GTX Titan than it can provide and dip below 60 frames per second once in a while, and if they had stuck with a 60 hertz monitor, I think it would have made for a much more impressive first experience. So, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, one, I'm just not a fan of this panel. Like, it's just not a like it's it okay terrible with games. It's just not a I mean, and part of it, it's it's a cheaper display, right? Um, well, it's not, but <laughs> well, yeah, I know, but it's not like a, you know, it's not like a $600 display, right? Or a $1,000 okay. display. Um, so and, and again, for games, like whatever you get lost in it, it's fine. Um, so I, I wasn't a huge fan of, of the display they chose. My guess is it was probably one of the easiest to kind of retrofit. Yeah. Um, and even if you, I actually, I want to take apart one of the ones that isn't a G-Sync monitor. Cause I, I don't know if you saw on the inside of it, it's got yeah. an NVIDIA branded PCB. Yeah, and, I did see that. Uh, so I don't know. Cause like they, you know, the whole thing is, well, we just replaced the scaler. Um, but at least in yeah, this display, no. they replaced, like, it looks like they replaced just, there's this entire PCB that they've changed, but I don't know if the original also was designed by NVIDIA. So that, that's something I'm curious about. So um, I had the same conversation with them. Sorry. Uh, hold that thought. I had the same conversation with them on the phone where I actually, cause I've had a lot of people asking me, Linus, are we going to be able to mod our existing monitors and add G-Sync functionality to them after the fact? And what Tom said was... Um, well, I, I, I guess you could, but you would basically be soldering and like building a connector harness out of the interface for the panel itself and then connecting the, 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 the G-Sync hardware that's inside your existing monitor. And like, you'd be, you'd be doing this weird Frankenstein thing. But when, when I opened it up, it looked, aside from just lining up the wires here and making sure that you don't have any anything crossed and anything configured incorrectly, it looked very possible. Yeah, so that's why I'm curious to see what like a normal one of these monitors looks like on the inside. Cause yeah. I, I don't know about yours, mine was like the, all the hardware, um, the scalar board and the Nvidia like motherboard that it plugged into, that was all just like taped in place. Like, yes. <laughs> there, were, <laughs> there were no screws, it was just tape. <laughs> and, so I, I, I don't, I, I'm just really curious to see what the, the unmodified Asus display looks like. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, for, for folks who haven't seen it before, right? Like the sweet spot for G-Sync is somewhere in that, 
you know, for me, I, I found it to be like 38 to, to 60 frames a second. Yeah. Um, whereas normally when you're running VSync on, on a 60 hertz panel, you start dropping below in that range and start getting like this really, really variable frame rate um, that's out of sync with with your monitor, you do get this judder, right? Like it's it's clear that, you know, whatever you've walked into a room where there's just like really detailed paintings on the wall and stuff, right? Or like there's just tons of foliage outside um, and you get this judder and you just kind of deal with it. And then with G-Sync in that exact same situation, it kind of feels like 60 frames a second. Um, it kind of does actually. It was, I mean, you tried it, right? Yeah, no, it feels really good. It feels really good, yeah. Mm. That's not the kind of show we're running here, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. Dude, that's what I thought I was calling into. I don't know. just talked about a bunch of really boring stuff. So. <laughs> he said he wasn't in a suit. He's ready in his PJs. Like, he's in his... Yeah, his it's like, what, what are you wearing over there? <laughs> Dude, the suit is, like, long gone, man. Like, <laughs> wait, I just got back from a trip, man. That thing is it's done. It's done. Um... <laughs> No, so I agree. Like they they picked a, an interesting panel. Um, I you know I was able to find a bunch of games where even on a seven sixty, you know, dropping below sixty wasn't an issue. Um, but what I found is just the experience is terrible if you drop below thirty. Like it's just it yeah. gets real bad. Um, so you you really need fast enough to be above thirty. Uh, but you know, you need the, the optimal combination of, of settings and hardware to make sure you're always in that sweet spot for this to do anything. Right. You know, um, what's funny, uh, sorry, go, go ahead. You can finish that thought, but I just, I have another thing to add to the V sync on versus G sync scenario. Okay. Yeah. No, no all I was going to say is this actually, um, what Carmack said, I think he was the one that said it on stage resonates really well with me now in that, uh, game developers no longer have to target 60 right like yeah. they can they can be okay dipping down to some of these lower oh and that's assuming that this is something that's you know supported by more than just nvidia but i i think that's where a lot of the potential is that and and it's a good way of dealing with the stupidly high resolution displays which formerly you know you needed to have basically whatever the most expensive by jensen and new ferrari kind of or koenigsegg kind of cards were <laughs> <laughs> so my whole thing on the V-Sync versus G-Sync is I agree with you completely that it helps with the, the stutter, which it does, and that's great and it's fantastic. But for me, my biggest problem with V-Sync isn't really stutter because I tend to run very high-end hardware. So even from a high-end gamer perspective, something I think NVIDIA isn't talking about enough, maybe because they don't know how to quantify it, and maybe because such a small subset of their customers will even be able to relate to it because it'll only be the high-end guys. But to me, my big problem with V-Sync has always been input lag. I can feel it, particularly in some game engines where Left 4 Dead was the first game, I think, where it really drove me absolutely bananas to have to choose between the terrible tearing in that game and the terrible input lag that for whatever reason was is present in that particular source-based game. Um, and, and I just couldn't play with V-Sync on because the delay was so substantial. G-Sync means the leg goes away. And, and, and NVIDIA doesn't seem to be talking about that in, in, the, in the right way. Do you see that as a major benefit? Or, and are they missing the boat here? No, that, so I agree with you. That's something actually I wish I had more time to, to deal with. Um, so I was, I was at some other meetings um, when the G-Sync monitor arrived and I got back basically, I don't know, Sunday morning. And, you know, then I killed the first day and a half trying to figure out what was wrong with the thing. And then that left me with, you know, basically like two days to, to deal with all of this. So I didn't get to go in depth into input lag. Um, but I know that's, that's a big component. Um, I think it's a question of, you know, which end do you attack, right? I think the, the cell they have here with the, hey, this makes everything smoother bit, I think that's a very experiential cell that, that applies to a very wide audience or a very broad audience. I think, and, and I think a lot of what NVIDIA has been doing has been trying to go after that, you know, almost the console gamer, right? The person who doesn't really know or understand what's going on um, and, and, you know, they're not playing Burn. competitively. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're going after that market. And, and I, think, um, I think, you know, reducing input lag is a, a, a definite advantage. Um, but I, I think, like you said, that, that tailors to a, a slightly smaller um, niche. Right. 
one thing, one analogy I liked using for G-Sync actually, and like it's it's not perfect because Project Butter introduced V-Sync to Android, um, or that like it, it used V-Sync, so it's not perfect. But what Project D Butter did for the Android side of things, I see G-Sync doing for the PC side of things because beforehand there was all these all these drawbacks and different things you could have to make it faster, but then it would look kind of gross. It was just it was never very smooth and it was never perfect. And Project Butter just launched them forward in that direction yeah because it was almost this intangible wow my phone just feels well like butter and i mean g-sync is it's uh, yeah yeah butter for the pc so you can't you can't actually PC really butter? use it because because project butter brought in v-sync but i still like using it because of the general idea so next topic is haswell e now this particular this particular site that has the uh the haswell e leaked specs um they've been known to be right once in a while and not necessarily right all the time um so it's anantech.com we're gonna head over no i'm just kidding uh so <laughs> that's this mean. Was, that's mean. <laughs> this is actually posted by digital nav on our forum um, and the original article is from WCCF Tech, but have you had a look at the sort of these leaked um, rumored specs and what are your thoughts on Haswell E versus uh, what we have now, which is Ivy Bridge E? Do we need eight core on the desktop? How important is this even? Um, so yeah, I, I actually I didn't realize that this, this had leaked yet. Um, so I, I don't I didn't pay much attention to you know how accurate or inaccurate it was. Um, they actually had uh, Haswell E running in IDF um, at IDF last year or oh crap this year still. Yeah. Um, they had it running just as a DDR4 demo. Um, so so samples have been out there. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if you know people got wind of it. Um, how important is this going to be? I the 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 whole you know, Sandy Bridge E, Ivy Bridge E, and, and looking at Haswell E, that's just a really weird family of parts to me. What I what I want is something in between the two that I don't have to use like a weird socket to get to. Um, right. And I think we might get that with, you know, it sounds like they're going to do socketed Broadwell and, and bring Crystal Well on board, but I'm guessing they won't, you know, they won't improve Crystal Well at all. It'll still be the same thing we have today. Um, but I, I, I don't know. that I'm more interested in that personally. Um, do we need eight cores on the desktop? Yeah, if you're doing like a lot of like really, really heavy professional video work, I can see that being very, very exciting. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I'd be fine with it if it weren't out of sync with the rest of the desktop stuff, right? right. I don't like this whole, yeah, you can get something that's, you know, a little better, but it's a year out of phase with everything else. Like, yeah, I don't know. You've, you've got smart response here. You've got, you know, the, you've got quick sync here, but you've got more cores there and more RAM there. This fragmentation or the segmentation or whatever you want to call it um, really bothers me. And I guess that's pretty much what you're alluding to right now. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm just not a fan of it. Like, it's, it's, uh, you know, it is what it is. Like you can't, it's, I mean, because this is effectively a server part and, and they're just kind of making a, a desktop version of it. Um, so it's it's nice, like it'll obviously, it'll improve over Ivy Bridgey. Um, you know, we already know what Haswell can do in terms of a, a per core IPC improvement. Um, yeah. So Overclocking I, will be mediocre. You know, all these things we know already. Yeah, it, I mean, it'll be a better platform at least, um, uh, which will be nice. <laughs> like because uh you know x79 is kind of old now um so it'll it'll at least take care of that um well, but yeah say to say to three ports yes finally yeah I, i'm just not a fan of the trade-off like i i don't for me i would i would wait for broadwell desktop it'll be cheaper and, and likely be close enough um although you know eight cores is nice i won't i won't i won't hate on that too much fair enough all right. Well, I think that's uh, I think that's pretty much all the time we have. I don't want to keep you too long. I think we kept you ten minutes over time as it is. But uh, maybe just if you want to give the oh my goodness, I realize we don't have our guest thing up there anymore. Um, if you want to give the uh, the peeps a way to find you if they're interested in whether it's your written work or your Twitter or whatever else, uh, we'd love to at least drive a few more followers your way if people enjoyed your presence on the show, and I certainly did. I think that the the viewers have been teasing me in the Twitch chat the entire time for fangirling, but I don't care. I'm proud of it. <laughs> so just go ahead and uh, let them know where they can find you. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Um, you can find uh, me sometimes at anontech.com. That's A-N-A-N-D-T-E-C-H.com. Um, or on Twitter, which is at anonshimpy. Um, A-N-A-N-D-S-H-I-M-P-I. 
Um, and yeah, congrats again on everything, man. You've, you've been doing a good job. And uh, thanks for having me on. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, until I see you next, I'll probably run into you at CES somewhere. So I'll, I'll come say hi. Yep, I'll yes, be just will. completely demoralized and just tired. And <laughs> <laughs> Me too, man. <laughs> yeah, yep, CES is happening. <laughs> all right, man, I good know, luck. I've been booking all my meetings, and I'm looking at my calendar, and I'm just like, how the hell am I going to get to all these places? Oh, you don't. Like, you can't. You just, uh, you're just eternally late. Like, I'm already late to my first CES meeting. Like, that's just, <laughs> you just have to assume <laughs> that that's the case. You embrace the lateness, and, and you know, you'll, you'll be okay. NVIDIA is really mad at me because I'm I think I'm missing their thing because oh, uh, really? yeah I wasn't planning to be down at the show that early so when they sent out the save the date I just kind of I meant to send back an email that said I couldn't make it but instead I was just like oh well I'm not going to be there so I guess I just won't RSVP when the time comes and at that time they hadn't really been engaging with me as much yet either so it, I just I really didn't think about it that much but at the Montreal event we kind of synced up a little bit more and and sort of decided that we needed to do more together and then um, so anyway in the, in the meantime having not thought about that save the date I uh, AMD asked me to be at their thing and I kind of went oh well I'm not going to be there and they said oh well don't worry about it we'll cover your extra hotel and we'll cover any fees to change your flight or whatever else we really want you to be there and I kind of went oh okay well sure so now NVIDIA reminds me about that thing and I'm like, oh, I'll be there, but oh, I'm going to be at AMD's thing because <laughs> they're covering my hotel. I can't not be there. So that's, that's real awkward. They were like, really? We sent you a save the date like weeks ago, man. I'm like, ah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's not going to go over well. They'll probably like have you beaten or something. Yeah. <laughs> In Vegas. I hope they at least use the bar of soap so that I'm not all bruised for the rest of the week. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they uh, no, they'll just they'll, they'll toy with you emotionally. It's that's usually how it is. <laughs> they'll toy with you emotionally with a bar of soap, <laughs> or it oh, might man. involve soap and other. I don't know. Anyway, okay, <laughs> I'll talk to you later, man. I'll see you at the show. All right, dude. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. User All right, so guys, that time. was awfully fun, at least for me, because I'm such a fangirl of time. Anon, and I love everything he does. So let's go ahead and move into our sponsor segments for the day. So sponsor number one is a new one. Intel, this is their first time sponsoring the LAN show, so let's give a big virtual round of applause to Intel for having the foresight and the good taste to sponsor this tasteful show. Foresight and good taste. Yeah, speaking of tasteful and bars of soap, uh, the Romans, they have a game called Rome 2 Total War, which didn't necessarily get the greatest critical reception right off the bat, but for some reason, I'm on their PR contacts, like, mailing list, so every time a patch drops, or every time there's a new DLC, I'm getting emails about it, so apparently they've fixed a lot of the stuff, and it, even if it's not 100% fixed now, it is definitely moving in the right direction, they're working on the AI, they're adding more campaign elements and all that good stuff. So, if nothing else, if you were planning to buy a Core i5 or Core i7 4th gen processor, so basically um, a 4670K, unlocked 4th gen processor, so a 4670K or a 4770K, then you might as well get your free copy of Rome 2 Total War from participating retailers. So I know it's at Newegg, I know it's at MCIX, I know it's at Amazon, those are the ones that I'm 100% aware of, but there may be other ones as well. And if you're building a PC for someone else who's, uh, uh, one of the things I used to do all the time when I built PCs for people, when I actually had any time at all in the universe um, was I would make the deal I'll build your PC for you for free but I want your game coupons so even if you're not building a PC for yourself maybe try and figure out how to scoop a free copy by having them buy their, their 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 processor from a qualifying retailer so there you go guys our next one is uh, oh, apparently we just dropped a bunch of frames like all of a we've, sudden we've there. been uh, we've been fairly consistently dropping frames we're still live though sweet all right our other sponsor today where is my lower third for hotspot shield? Oh, I don't think we've run a hotspot shield. You know what? The stream was going so smoothly. It was going really well. I asked you right before we went live, too. Yep, like, all right. Hotspot Shield. So Hotspot Shield is the easy VPN solution that I actually had to use in order to... What's up? Oh, I guess I can take these off. That I had to use in order to get my Google Glass because I had to pretend I was from the United States. What a VPN does, for those of you who aren't familiar, although I'm sure most of you are because you're all regular watchers of the show and you always watch us every Friday, right? 
you know, nothing else to do on a Friday evening. Lord knows we don't have anything better to do tonight. Nope. Um, so I had to use Hotspot Shield VPN in order to fake where I was located. I had to pretend I was in the US and Hotspot Shield does that just fine. This is great for useful things like um, buying things that are only available in the US. It's great for things like accessing services that are only available in the US, such as US Netflix. If you happen to not be in America and you want to watch all the latest episodes of all the latest cool stuff, um, as well as many other online video streaming services. It's great for that. It's great for protecting your identity and your location, that which people can find out quite easily using your IP address. I mean, it's a little bit tougher to find out your identity, but your location certainly uh, using your IP address. If you go through a VPN service such as Hotspot Shield, and it works on your PC, on your mobile devices, and I guess, well, the PC and mobile devices, right? Yeah. Yay! Hotspot Shield. So, you can get 20% off Elite Prices by using code LINUS on your very first purchase. So go ahead and check that out, guys. It is definitely better than... Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Apparently someone says do not use Hotspot Shield. They make it extremely difficult to cancel a subscription and will still charge you after you cancel it. That's from Dangerous Person. Okay, well one thing that I can respond to that with is if you post a problem with Hotspot Shield on the Hotspot Shield thread on Linus Tech Tips forum, they have people that will take care of that for you right away. So we actually get special service yeah. for our four members from an escalation point that is above the regular customer service. So, yay. Definitely check them out. Um, one thing is wearing a Team OCZ shirt, like, is that, is that in mourning? Is, is this like a sign of like, I, I miss you? No, or? it's just a nice shirt. It's, um, what is it? So it has nothing it's to American do with It's American Apparel. The, oh yeah, there you go. Yeah. Swag shirts from American Apparel. I know, like... they're awesome. So it's just like, and I don't know, it's so subtle. Like I bet no one even noticed I was wearing oh, an OCZ shirt. They did. Oh, did they? Yeah. Really? Oh, I'm yeah. surprised. It's just, it's just funny because of the recent like purchase and bankruptcy whatnot thing that was going on. <laughs> Lamb Bobdol says, don't listen to dangerous person. He called me a expletive, expletive, expletive. <laughs> Okay, well, we're not trying to discredit the guy. You might be, you know, might have had a bad experience. I'm just saying that you can get special service if you go through the Linus Tech Tips forum, which is awesome, by the way. Before we move on, I want to quickly go through my, my favorite moments of the Anand Linus meeting version 2. Really? That's um, how you're going to be about this? The, wow. I think that was the most glorious, fantastic, incredibly shiny intro we've ever had for anyone ever. Which was the, like, I love you, please don't run away because I love you so much intro, which was amazing. Um, I don't think you've ever asked someone if you could interrupt them before. And then nope, after doing that... I do that, usually just talk over them. Yep, and then after that, you then interrupted him, but paused for a second, you're like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, is this okay? And then he said yes, and then you kept going, which was fantastic. And then later on, you went to go interrupt him, but then stopped yourself and said, oh... I I want to bring this up later, but, but 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 you can keep going. It's okay. And then drew back, and I, I thought that was just fantastic. And then once it was over, even though it had gone over time, uh -huh. you made it continue, which was just, it was just beautiful. <laughs> I wish I still had, do we still have the footage? I don't know. I'm actually not sure. I don't know what they did with it. They hid it okay, from me. Yeah. If we still have the footage, I might leak some of it on the after party tonight. But I'm not sure if we still have the wow. footage. Wow. That's how you're going to be about this. Oh, I forgot. We have some other sponsor messages. Oh. We talked about our CES sponsors last week. So uh, NCIX is our gold sponsor. Basically, yep. they're paying the bulk of what it costs for us to be at CES and bring you guys the awesome content that we're going to bring you guys from there. Our second sponsor is Corsair. So they're one of our two silver sponsors. And then our third sponsor answer is confirmed now. It's funny because last week on the show when I was like, yeah, it'll probably be WD, they had not confirmed <laughs> anything. They basically hadn't replied to my email. But... <laughs> so I got on the phone with them this week and I was like, so um, I haven't like sent out proposals to anyone else because I was really hoping you guys would take it. And they're just like, Oh, yeah, okay, I guess so. Sure, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll take it, we'll take it. So, I also have something pretty exciting to tell you guys about WD's present at the show, presence at the show. They are doing a WD fan night, which you can only get to if you hear about it through someone that they're affiliated with. Basically, this isn't just on the WD website, okay? You have to hear about it somewhere. Spaces will fill up if you're planning to be at CES, if you're planning, so if you're going to be down in Las Vegas at the beginning of January, you can register at wdpromotion.com slash wdfannight. And uh, there's going to be 
Uh, creative professionals such as renowned Sports Illustrated photographer Peter Reed Miller, professional gamers Scara and ODEE -E from Team Dignitas, artist Drew Brophy, musician Mike I. Paris from the band OAR or OR. I don't even know who any of these people are. I'm so I I live on like another <laughs> planet where all that exists is work and my baby. He, he's always like, oh, why do you think I'm like out of tune with society and stuff? And then if you go watch and if you go back and watch the Omni video when he's like Converse. <laughs> <laughs> no one's seen Converse before. <laughs> because I don't leave my house, okay? <laughs> or this place. <laughs> anyway, guys, check it out. WD Fan Night. I, I'm pretty sure I'll be there. I think it's on my calendar. That's Tuesday, January 7th. Let me check my calendar. So, guys, please only sign up if you're actually going to be in Vegas during that time and you're actually planning to go there. So, um, you know, you don't want to take away a spot from someone else who could otherwise be there. Uh, but yes, I will be there. I will be there on WD Fan Appreciation Night, so that's going to be pretty cool. Okay, so I think without further ado, I don't have any topics to further ado right now, because for some reason, in my awe of Anon while he was on the show, I closed my topics doc, so go ahead and find <laughs> our next one here. Splurged out the topics doc yeah, somehow. Either way, we, we can do uh, consumer versus enterprise hard drive reliability, so I believe... The article was such BS, unfortunately. I mean, it would have been great if it was real. So Well, it's real. It's real. It's just not scientifically no. valid in any way. So this was tweeted to me by Austin at Top Notch PC LOL. Guys, to be clear, tweeting something at me is not the best way to get an article featured on the show. Please post in the new section of Linus Tech Tips forum. Um, but I, sometimes I do happen to see things on Twitter and they do make their way into the doc. So Backblaze finds enterprise drives fail more often than consumer hard drives is the extremely incendiary top or, um, headline of this article. So I'll let you tear it apart. I think they're just mad. To be completely honest, I'm assuming that's where this is coming from. They're like, oh, why are so many failing? Let's rip them apart. Because they, they have to understand that the way they did this was not entirely true. And like a lot of the quotes that are in this are directly from Back, Black Blaze's, Back Blaze's blog. It's a lot of Bs. Back Blaze blog. Um, like, like it's directly in there where it's like, well, but, uh, do you think reliability of these make any sense? No. Like it's, it's, all, it's all, the sensationalized part is in Back Blaze's blog. So that was kind of interesting. The sample size is like not okay. There's 368 enterprise drives and there's 14,719 consumer drives. Um, duh, 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 where is it? Oh crap. Where was the failure rates? Uh, I thought you put it in the doc. I thought I did too. So apparently 17 enterprise drives failed over two years and 613 consumer drives failed. Then they broke it down to percentages and found that 4.6% of the enterprise drives failed while 4.2% of the consumer drives failed. But there's a big problem with that, which you outlined here perfectly. Which is where if one enterprise, one less enterprise drive failed, they were almost equated for percentages. And if two less failed, it was like a chunk better, like two... 0.2% better, which is like, no, to be able to do an actual study like this, you need one, the sample sizes need to be the same freaking side, and two, they weren't tested in the same environments. Yes, they were tested in very different environments. So the enterprise, basically, the only real conclusion that we can take away from this, because the enterprise drives were tested in a much heavier workload than the consumer grade drives. So all we can take away from this is that Enterprise drives, when being used in their intended workload, which is much heavier, might fail about the same as consumer grade drives when used in a lighter workload. There, which there is was, like, what hard drive manufacturer wouldn't have freaking told you that? There, there was even <laughs> some more wonky stuff too, because the enterprise drives had nicer, more padded enclosures, but not by much, but then were worked a lot harder. And then the consumer drives had not as good enclosures that had a little bit more vibration, but then weren't worked as much. So like there's even more weird variables that you're throwing so in. So many variables. Yeah. So the one thing, one good takeaway from this in my mind is that, holy crap, consumer drives don't fail that much. Yeah. That That's was cool. really cool. Because we use consumer drives in our server. <laughs> yep. We use a lot of refurbished ones. No, too. no. There are no refurbs in the server right now. Okay. That's good. Although our storage expansion upgrade that's coming soon. So the, the working drive for 4K footage is mm. probably going to be refurb drives. But it's a working drive. But it'll be RAID 10. Okay. So it's, it's not going to be reliant on, you know, absolutely no drives can fail. OMG. So I'm, I'm going to throw a RAID 10 in there of yeah. three terabyte refurb drives. Cool. But yeah, like this article was 
This is not really great, in my opinion, but it's still an interesting thing to look at and like take the percentages not really 100% to heart, but you can look at it still and just, I, I don't know, maybe be a little bit more confident in your consumer drive and just make sure that it has good padding. You're probably good to go. All right, so this one, apparently I screwed up and uh, let me just make sure that there's nothing showing on my screen right now that's going to be a problem. I don't think so. Does my Hangouts matter? I can sign out, right? It shows the, the names. Hangouts. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Let's hold on. Let's scroll down. Should be fine. Yep. There's probably going to be something. Yeah, but I don't see something. anything. Okay, so here we go. All right, so screen share time, guys. This was a PM someone sent me. Please post in the news section of the forum, please. Um, anyway. Just don't go up. Here's a panel, so, so this is on the subject of the Dell 4K 28 inch monitor that's actually less expensive than the 4K 24 inch monitor, but uses a TN panel. So someone, uh, I don't even remember who it was because they didn't post on oh, the forum. So. Um, so someone said, here's a panel someone on G found. It seems to match up pretty well with what we know about the 28 inch monitor Dell's releasing for under $1,000. It is a TN panel, but it seems to be a really good TN panel. So it has wide color gamut, 10-bit color depth, although I've seen 6-bit TN panels that are definitely not as good as 6-bit yeah. IPS panels. So yeah. let's be real clear, more bits is not necessarily the most important thing in the world. 60 hertz refresh rate, which makes sense, and 80 degree viewing angle. It would make sense for it to be a TN panel since it's only $1,000, but it might not be that bad after all. So there it is, guys, the N280DGJ-L30. And the specs look like they that are be it. potentially not that bad. Oops, sorry, sorry, mm -hmm. sorry. Hey, what the? You somehow... Oh, wow. What have I done? Okay, hold on, guys. Bear with me for a second here. Uh, where is it? Okay, wow. Not sure what happened there. Okay, anyway, we're back. Um, so to be clear, good TN panels exist. They're still not... The one uses a TN panel. Yeah. The viewing angles are excellent. The color reproduction is excellent. So they do exist. Yep. They are slower than the overdriven TN panels that we find in products like that ASUS monitor that both Anand and I agree, which of course fills me with much, much wonderment, uh, both agree isn't very good because it's overdriven to refresh 144 times a second and still give you a crystal clear image. That means they just can't do as much with the quality of that image. So a good TN panel might not necessarily be as optimal for gaming. It might not be as fast, but the viewing angles and the color reproduction might actually be okay. So I'm pretty excited to see what Dell has up their sleeve with this 28 inch 4K monitor. Because in my mind, 24 may actually be a touch too small to even justify 4K. I mean, a 2560 by 1440, 24 inch, that's not bad. It'll be hard to pick out the individual pixels. Huh, I'm not sure. Well, I'll have to like compare them. Yeah, I guess to that's... To be honest, I'd have, I'd have to see them close up. All right, we're digging into my email again. For, do you have another topic? Do you want to do maybe a rapid-fire topic while I dig this up? I jump onto one, if you give me one second. Some of the rapid-fire topics got all messed up, but we can jump into the Xbox One thing. Ah, yes. Because this is hilarious. So trolled. <laughs> so apparently someone released an image, which we can maybe hopefully get on screen here soon, which it looks, looks fairly official. Like, it's not super well done, but it's okay. Um, it says Xbox 360 backwards compatibility unlock. By default, Xbox 360 backwards compatibility is disabled on Xbox One. To unlock it, follow these steps. Oh. One, go to the system menu. Two, press left button, right button, I, left trigger, right trigger. Right I know, but we might be doing podcasts soon. Oh, right. In order to, in order, in order quickly, select the developer console, check the enable dev kit box, Change sandbox ID to freezone.reboot, which is where you should start thinking this is kind of bullcrap. Um, <laughs> six, select reset home console, and then it says Xbox 360 games will now be playable on your console. The problem is it will just boot loop infinitely because you put it into reboot mode where it will just continuously reboot and will never actually really do anything. Essentially, breaking your Xbox One. Breaking your Xbox One. But wait, it gets better, folks, because that's not all from this week. We also have a da 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 da, da troll number two. Which is even better, in which my is opinion. actually even better. Did you know dot tumblr.com? <laughs> 
Any iPhone can be charged in the microwave oven. 15 to 25 times faster than the charger that came with it. Try it now. Plug your cable into the iPhone. Put your iPhone in the center of the oven and coil the cable around it. Step three, set the timer in the oven for 10 to 20 seconds. Step four, you now have a charged iPhone. This works because microwaves use the same principle as wireless charging pads by rearranging the electrons in your phone's battery to gather at the negative terminal. Remember to leave your cable plugged in. <laughs> so there are some there are some Yahoo Answers posts with folks being like, "Hey, I um, I tried it. Is there any way I can uh, fix it now?" And the answer is no, unfortunately. I love how the best answers the best answer on that one's like, "Dude, you zapped your phone." <laughs> uh, it's like, yeah, no, you 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 screwed up on that one. Not not gonna work out for you at all. Yeah, that is that is a crying shame right there. All right, so I'm ready with this next uh, this next article that's in my email supposedly. Um, <laughs> no, no, I am not. Hold on, I'll be ready in a second though. I'm almost ready. Okay. I'm almost ready. Should I try and grab something? Apple smartwatch is rumored to be coming in October 2014 and will apparently support wireless charging. I guess I kind of said the whole thing. Is that, I was just going to say, is that, is, that, is that the whole topic? <laughs> that's there, the whole topic. Is there more? Okay. That's what was the original source cool. again? I can't remember. For the Apple smartwatch? Yeah. They have they have been right about stuff in the past. That was our forum. And They've also been wrong about stuff in the past. So the so the original poster was Joe Petit? Joe Petit? Joe Petit? Yeah. Jo and the source is tweakers.net. All right, so let's go ahead and hop over to Linus's screen where Samsung sent me a pretty awesome email about their rapid technology being available on 840 Pro SSDs now. So if you already have an 840 Pro and the 840 Evo came out and you were like, Samsung, hey, hey, Samsung, hey, what, what's going on? Why don't I have rapid technology? Because Rapid is cool. What is this? Rapid allows you to use your RAM to accelerate your storage subsystem. It can use up to a gig of your RAM at a time, and it's awesome, and it works. But it was only available on Samsung, your consumer-grade drive, not your pro-grade drive. What is this? So it's now available for existing 840 Pro owners or anyone who buys that SSD in the future. And they've also enabled some new trusted computing thing on the 840 Evo, which I'm sure is important, but I'm not as interested in that as raw performance. Ooh. And finally... They have a one terabyte mSATA SSD now. So it's an 840 Evo, meaning you have support for Rapid, meaning you have support for their, you know, awesome data migration utility and all that great stuff. And you have a one terabyte of storage in That's a notebook. pretty sick. Which is just balling. My favorite part about mSATA SSDs is like, they're like, that big. Yeah, I know. They're tiny. They have so much ridiculous amounts of storage on them. I know. It's amazing. <laughs> it's it's kind of like those uh, those SanDisk USB drives that we had. Yeah. I showed you those things, right? Where it's like literally the size of the connector. Like I put it in. I'm like, how am I supposed to get this out of the port? Yeah. And it's like 64 gigs. It's like, <laughs> where'd you where'd you put that? <laughs> and we where'd have SD go? cards now from uh, Kings. Oh no, we have a, a micro SD from SanDisk as well that is 64 gigs and can do like 45 megabytes per second writes and like 90 megs per second reads. It's, ridiculous <laughs> flash storage it's not the end of development and uh, improvements there i know we're dropping a lot of frames guys there's not a whole lot we I've can been, do about it right I've now i've been talking to the twitch chat about all the different problems and whatnot that are going on with the frames we're good i think we'll yeah make it through so i think we covered all of our main topics for this week do we have anything left we have some stuff but this is hilarious oh yeah, yeah, yeah. this is actually slightly older news guys but check this out this is from holycaw.alltop.com 140,000 VHS tapes from 1977 to 2012 were found in storage. All right. So basically, Ms. Stokes, this lady, died at age 83. And at some point in 1977, she decided that she was going to tape all the news ever. So she planned her life around it. She would feed six-hour tapes into the news channel recorder's late at night, and then she'd wake up early the next day to change them or conscript family members to do it if she wasn't home. She'd cut short meals at restaurants to rush home before tapes ended. And when she got too old to keep up, she trained a younger helper named Frank to run the various recording equipment. So it is potentially the most, uh, the most complete archive. news recording archive in existence. And it's on... 140,000 VHS tapes. And who's going to deal with that? 
<laughs> I'd have to imagine it has to end up somewhere. You can't just throw all that history away. I know, but like, who's gonna... that's amazing. I know, but who's gonna do it? I don't know, like. And okay, one thing that I don't maybe know the if this oatmeal is true. can inspire people to do it. If he can build a Nikolai <laughs> Tesla museum, then maybe he can do this. Maybe they, that's the actually... oatmeal. If you're watching, which I know you aren't, he's not. No, it's <laughs> I way wish. too cool for us. I love the oatmeal. <laughs> Okay, if you got we, an antic to watch. If we can get the oatmeal on this show, then during his entire guest segment, I will like I'll go behind the couch, I will take my underwear off, and I will wear them on my head. <laughs> For the entire guest segment, okay? If someone can convince the oatmeal to come and be on our show for half an hour. Because I would fangirl oh out God. so hard. Would you fangirl out as hard as you do with an end? He hasn't had as much of an impact on the direction of my life as an end. Um, but I think he's awesome. Well, no, he has. I know. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. If it... I know. You know what? Screw you. He hasn't had this profound impact on my life. He hasn't driven me to do great things. In other news, the Nexus 5 <laughs> has had a silent hardware We weren't even done talking revision. about the last topic. Oh, we're done talking about it now. <laughs> The Nexus 5, this was posted by Joe Petit, Joe Petit, I don't know, man. Joe Petit <laughs> on the forum has had a silent hardware revision that actually addresses one of my major complaints about the, well, two of my major complaints about the device. Number one is that they have expanded the speaker grills. See, they're bigger now, so more sound in theory. Number two is they have updated the buttons to be harder to press and more clicky, a little bit more tactile. This might have seemed like a petty complaint, and I think some people didn't like this in my Nexus 5 review, but to me, having buttons positioned so that when you go to press one of them, you accidentally press the one that is opposed to it on the other side of the phone is a big usability problem. Accidentally changing your volume all the time or whatever else is a problem. I don't like that on the HTC One as well. That's one of my major complaints on this phone because the lock is up here, the volume is here, so the way a right-handed person might hold the phone to unlock it is like this, and you often match, match that volume button, and they're not, they don't stick out far enough, and they're not hard enough to press for you to really feel it, so I thought that was a valid complaint, and I was right, because they fixed it. Either way, how would you feel if you were a Nexus 5 owner? I uh, actually kind of gypped. Kind of owned. Because if I, if I like, Gypped if I... is actually a bad word. You may not even know that. No. Yeah, because it, it refers really to gypsies. Care. Pretty much. Like means that they there's like an insane people. amount of words that are actually terrible, and people use them every day. Did you know that referring to someone as a young buck is actually disrespectful as well? It's it's uh, it was like an, an insult for Native Americans, if I recall correctly. Yeah, there's like ten. Someone said things. that in my like grade ten social studies class, and the teacher like flipped out, and she had no idea. She was like. <laughs> and she's like the nicest girl in the world, like one of those just like super nice girls. Why would nice she girls. flip out? She obviously didn't know. I don't. He was kind of an interesting guy. It's just crazy. Yeah. All right. I'm not going like, to talk about former teachers on the show. I, they might be watching. They probably aren't. But. I would. I like a lot of my former teachers. Oh. Mr. Thompson, Mr. First, Mr. Trattle. Probably right. none of them are watching at all. Definitely probably none know. of them are watching at all. But that would be awesome. Isn't it sad that they don't know how famous you are now? Actually, some of them do. Do they? Oh, cool. So the Pirate Bay <laughs> is going to be making domain names irrelevant. They've actually switched domain names twice in a matter of days. And their new system is going to allow them to get around domain takedowns by, um, well, implementing the Pirate Bay within its own web browser. Whoa. I didn't read this topic. I just assumed they had some other thing going on. That's nope. crazy. So this was posted by Guns Cool on the forum, and uh, the original article is from techienews.co.uk. I think it's .co.uk. I think that's so the I'm way assuming the, the browser will update, and then if you type in Pirate Bay, it'll just automatically bring you to whatever the... Wow. So says new system will make domain names irrelevant. Uh, so something, 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 etc. So I actually don't understand. I'm not like I'm not a web developer or anything like that, and I'm not sure exactly how this works. But the Pirate Bay um, has revealed that this switch to PirateBay.pe is a temporary switch. The team is working on a BitTorrent powered browser that will enable users to store and share files with other users without requiring a central hosting, thereby eliminating the need for domain name completely. So, the actual sharing of tracker information will be done peer-to-peer -peer in much the same way that the file sharing is already done peer-to-peer, -peer, so there will be no one to go after, in theory. Could they just use, like, a lightly modified version of 
Firefox. So quote from the article is, once that is available, all links and sites will be accessible through a perfectly legal piece of browser software, and the rest of it will be P2P with no central point to attack via the legal system. I think, I don't know if they're going to, but I think they could just lightly modify the open source code for Firefox and just like easily have this highly up updated, really well performing browser. So isn't that fascinating? That's smart. I don't, like, they might be making their own from the ground up. I have no idea. I haven't read this um, article, unfortunately, although I'm, like, super interested now, and I'm totally going to read it. I later. added this at the last minute. I actually didn't tell them. Um, um, I was just posting links on my phone. I know. I saw that coming in. I was just yeah. focused on editing the other the uh, the other video. Um, so that's fascinating, eh? That's super crazy. Score one for the pirates, potentially, here. Like, how do you get around that? Because, yeah, it, it could just be, like, a button on the browser, that is just automatically updated and directed to the, the site or, or like there, yep. there's so many or it doesn't even have to be a website at that point the browser could just directly interface with it automatically yeah like holy crap yeah that's good cool. because there's there's stuff like this there's there's been like browsing applications like views i guess you could technically say but it still interfaces with websites that actually manage everything it's just a, a browser that accesses those websites this way it would be Oh, man. Yeah, I know. It's like mine. Like, Huge deal. They just won the game. The game. Yeah. The game. For now. The game. I'm trolling people. Oh, all right. All right. Well, that's it, guys. Thank you so much for watching The WAN Show. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, wow, we're ending somewhat on time today. And so we started kind of, on time. Yeah. Besides the dropped frames, which hopefully we'll have addressed next week with yeah. our new fiber optic uplink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Super stoked for that. That's going to be awesome. So take care, guys. Thank you again for watching. And uh, what do I usually say at the end of this show? I think it changes all the time, actually. Does it change all the time? And then we usually end up talking and then just randomly ending the broadcast. Big thanks to our sponsors, Hotspot Shield and Intel, and our CES sponsors, who are NCIX, Corsair, and Western Digital. How, how long until Someone says this? unsubbed, unfollowed. Well, sorry, man. That's is it because I forgot what to say at the end? How, how long until CES? Is it a month? It's less than a month. Like three Yeah, it's weeks? coming up on like the third. Yeah, it's like three weeks. We're going to die. Oh, my right. God. Peace out, everyone. Okay, bye. Oh, what the... Oh, what? <laughs> Come on. Oh, that means that... You, it's not done. Is the volume even going to be right? What, what, are you, what are you talking about? I'm putting on our, our intro thing. Oh, the um, volume's not going to be right. Can you just play the other scene? I don't think... Is it in there? No, you oh, moved it. No, I moved it from this one. I think we're done here. Okay. <laughs>